Mr. Rennett. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy Chair. Uh, and I rise today too to speak in favour of this bill. Uh, I, I, uh, I think uh, it is way overdue, uh, and I think that it's a real shame uh, that this wasn't introduced earlier because too many people have suffered. And what's worse is, is that the people who have been injured by the vaccine uh, have effectively been gaslighted and haven't got proper compensation to help with their injuries. And to think that we could spend hundreds of billions of dollars on shutting down a country uh, in regards to coronavirus uh, when young you know, people of health, health, healthy working age people had very little risk from the virus and yet spend nothing on the same people when they were injured by the vaccine is gross hypocrisy. But before I get into the vaccine, I actually want to talk about this side of the chamber and what the, the Liberal Party pretends to believe in or was what, what we're supposed to believe in, and that is capitalism. And of course, a capitalist is someone who actually risks their own capital. And as I've always said, I don't believe in the free markets, and, and I'm in good company there because Robert Menzies himself didn't believe in free markets. He said it in a forgotten people speech. He said we should not go back to the old and selfish notions of laissez faire. Uh, I've spent my whole life working in finance, and I've never seen freedom as a line item on the balance sheet. There's only two outcomes in a market you're either making money or you're losing money. And the real capitalists out there are the people, uh, the Australians who get, get out of bed every day and put their nose to the grindstone. And that's, I don't care whether you're a teacher or a nurse or, or a, a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer or a scientist, if you're out there busting your gut, or a small business I should add, you're the one risking your capital. Uh, and you know, I've always tended, tended to have thought of that in terms of economics, but unfortunately, unfortunately because of this, you know, contrived uh, crisis uh, that was brought about by state governments who just uh, lost, lost the plot, basically. Uh, we've now found that people had to risk their health uh, because of the government mandate, and that is totally wrong. Uh, and I think that we need to have a good look at that, uh, because effectively I can tell you who aren't capitalists, and that's big corporations. And they've never been capitalists because they've always hid, hid it under the veil of limited liability. And this is another example of where big pharma, and it's the same, doesn't matter, it's the same for bureaucrats, they don't have to be held accountable for the same for superannuation funds, they don't have to be accountable because they risk other people's capital. And when you have situations of where you have big organisations risking other people's capital, you need proper checks and balances. And one of those things is definitely not indemnities, because indemnities effectively remove the checks and balances. Okay, the whole point of government is to protect government, or the whole point of a democracy is to protect government from the people. And it's not the other way around. I mean, we are here to protect the people. It is not, we are not here to protect the big end of town. We are not here to protect corporations, the bureaucrats, or big wealth, wealth funds who own these big corporations today. I mean, the corporations are just puppets on the string now. The puppeteers and the puppet masters are actually the superannuation funds here in Australia or BlackRock and Vanguard overseas. And they have these cross interests that allow them to get away uh, with lots of things. Now, the other thing that makes this indemnity particularly bad is the fact that there's been no transparency about the contract. We have on many occasions tried to get the terms and conditions of the contract with Pfizer, and it hasn't been forthcoming. So yet again, one of the bulwarks of democracy is accountability and transparency, and we have not got that. So number one, it's bad that we didn't ha uh, we've been given an indemnity without uh, knowing the risks. Number two, it's even worse that we aren't being transparent. And number three uh, is that I don't believe that this contract will still hold up. I was taught at university in introductory law in the bowels of the Forgan Smith building out at Queensland University that there's three elements to a contract. There's the offer, there's an acceptance, and there's terms and conditions. And the terms and conditions of this uh, particular drug were not made available to the people. They were not made available to the people. And one of the things in uh, the immunisation schedule, uh, that, you know, it's, it's on the internet there, and it's basically an oral contract between the Australian government uh, and the people, the immunisation handbook, is that people have to be fully informed about the risks of the drug before they are taking it. And of course, they weren't fully informed at all. Okay, they were lied to. They were lied to by the government and they were lied to by Big Pharma. And you don't need to take my word for it, uh, because right here we've got the Australian Public Assessment Report 
for the Pfizer vaccine. And if we turn to page, and this came out by the way in January 2021, so you can Google this. It's the Product Assessment Report, the Australian Public Assessment Report. If you go to page 31, you will see what they tested this on. And I'm just going to read out some of the missing information that was uh, involved with the, uh, the sale of this drug. Missing information: use in pregnancy and whilst breastfeeding. Use in immunocompromised patients. Now, I wonder why they did that, and I'll tell you why this, is really, this really matters. Because last week, I finally got the TGA to admit that myocarditis is an autoimmune disease. Okay, so they knew. So this is the thing: a vaccine, a normal vaccine, generates an immune response against the foreign body that's in the vaccine. This vaccine doesn't do that. This vaccine creates an autoimmune response. Okay, by generating a T cell response against the little peptides that are presented on the cell membrane. That's in the um, Pfizer FOI 2389-6 report okay, that generates a T cell response. Okay, so that means you're now getting an autoimmune response against your own cells. So the pathway of this vaccine was completely different. It created an autoimmune response. And yet right here, they never actually tested the drug on immunocompromised patients. They've also avoided use so one of the missing information is also use in frail patients with comorbidities. Well, for example, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, diabetes, well, diabetes has jumped a lot in excess deaths. It's one of the largest contributors to excess deaths, and yet they never tested for diabetes. Chronic neurological disease and cardiovascular disorders. Mm, is myocarditis a cardiovascular disorder? Mm. And all of this was missing information. And yet again, it's relevant because last week uh, Pfizer and Moderna could not explain why their vaccine causes myocarditis. Well, it turns out that they never actually tried to find out before they rolled this thing out. They were happy to say the vaccine was safe and effective, but they, couldn't actually, they didn't actually understand what they were selling. And of course, we've got use in patients with autoimmune or inflammatory disorders. Wow. Uh, interaction with other vaccines and long term safety data. So they lied, people. They lied and people died. And yet these people were given an indemnity. Okay? I've been contacted by the mother of a child this week whose child was recognised by the TGA, who was offered $85,000. And that included $15,000 for funeral costs. Her daughter was worth $70,000. That is a disgrace. That is an absolute disgrace. But let's go to the actual initial reason why this was approved. And this is on page seven of the product assessment report. And this says uh, COVID-19 vaccine has provisional approval for the indication below. Active immunisation to prevent coronavirus disease 2019, caused by SARS-CoV-2 in individuals 16 years of age or older. This decision has been made on the basis of short-term efficacy, you're not wrong about that, and safety data, and continue approval depends on the evidence of longer-term efficacy and safety. Well, guess what? The TGA approved this, fully approved the Pfizer vaccine just last week, I think. So they're not really uh, being held to account on what they said they do. But let's talk about the, the so-called efficacy and the 95 per cent efficacy that the Pfizer originally claimed uh, that they provided. It turns out that was all a scam because, you see, in the initial trial there were about 44,000 uh, participants in the trial, and of the uh, 20,000 each they ended up measuring, 162 in, in the non-vaccinated group caught COVID and only eight in the vaccinated group caught COVID. That was less than 1 per cent of the trial group in either trial. That is not statistically significant. But here's what's interesting, right, is that they excluded from this trial 1,594 people were suspected but not confirmed in the inoculation group, and 1,816 people were suspected to have COVID but not confirmed in the vaccine group. Okay, so they actually excluded uh, three and a half thousand people from the actual efficacy trial. Now, the reason why they did that was that if they'd included all those people, it would have reduced the uh, relative risk reduction to 19 per cent. 
and that was below the 50 per cent threshold necessary to get European approval for the vaccine. So they've engaged in deliberate, in my view, fraud. But you don't have to take, just talk about the efficacy. Let's talk about the situation with Maddie DeGarry. She was one of the children who was in the, in the children's adolescent trial, and she ended up in a wheelchair being fed through a tube. And how did uh, Pfizer describe her injury? As a functional abdominal pain. This was a girl who developed gastroparesis, nausea, vomiting, erratic blood pressure, memory loss, brain fog, headaches, dizziness, fainting, seizures, verbal and motor tics, menstrual cycle issues, lost feeling from the waist down, hence the wheelchair, lost bowel and bladder control, and had an astrogastric tube placed because she lost her ability to eat. She was hospitalised many times uh, and has been wheelchair bound and fed via a tube. And how did Pfizer treat this victim of their own trial? They gaslighted her. They gaslighted her own injury. Shame on you, Pfizer. What an absolute disgrace. And we gave these people indemnity. But that's not all. Because you see, one of the things that these people are claiming, Pfizer is claimed, is that they, you know, okay. Well, you know, it wasn't meant to stop uh, transmission and it wasn't meant to stop efficacy. But here's the thing. If you actually look at their own trial data, they claim so Pfizer now last week were claiming that it's going to reduce serious illness, right? And, and death. Well, that's not true because their own six month data that was reported in the New England Journal of Medicine showed that related adverse events from Pfizer were three hundred per cent higher. In, in the inoculation group, i.e. in the vaccine group, than in the placebo group. Any severe adverse event was 75 per cent higher uh, in, the, in the vaccine group than the actual uh, placebo group, and any serious adverse event was 10 per cent higher. So even in Pfizer's own tr six-month trial data, injuries were higher, significantly higher, in the vaccine group. And yet these people still try and claim that the vaccine reduces illness. Well, I find that very hard to believe. And you don't have to just base it on a trial, because we know in 2021 that in May 2021 the number of deaths jumped by about 4 per cent and continued to stay that high throughout the year, so that there were 172,000 deaths in 2021, all from May onwards, in the last eight months of the year, straight after the vaccine rollout. Now, this is significant because it was before COVID was in the community. So what caused it? There was almost 10,000 more deaths in 2021 than there was in 2020. And yes, 2020 saw a reduction of 2,000 deaths from 2019, so, but that's a long way short of 10,000. We had 1,300 deaths from COVID in 2021, but we had 1,000 deaths in 2020. So only out of that extra 10,000 deaths, was 300 was due to COVID. So what was the cause of all those other excess deaths? And why were those excess deaths in the states that were locked down? The highest jump was in Queensland and WA, where there was absolutely no COVID. Absolutely no COVID. And that figure is three standard deviations from the average mean of the prior five years. That is a sigma six event. That is a one in a thousand chance of happening statistically. There was, so that's an outlier of you know, enormous proportions. And yet these people will still sit here and claim that this vaccine reduced illness and death. And that is not true. But we can't get uh, Pfizer's contract. But what we can get is Pfizer's set of financial accounts. And I managed to get them yesterday. You can pay $47 to ATSIC and actually get their financial accounts. Because thank you, they Senator, don't just engage you, in deceptive Rennick, conduct. The time for debate has expired yeah. and you'll be in continuation when we resume to the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Amendment Vaccine Indemnity Bill of 2023 at a later date. Authorised G. Rennick, LMP Chermside.